something like one in 10 people are dyslexic. So if you're not dyslexic yourself, there's a good chance you know someone who is. When I went to school, you're more likely to get a clip around the ear than a diagnosis of dyslexia. Right from the beginning, I took an immediate dislike to school. You had to sit down, sit still, stay quiet, do as you were told, learn stuff. I didn't much like any of those things. Apart from being boring, I realized pretty quickly that whatever it was we were supposed to be doing, I wasn't very good at it. But then I found something I was good at. I realized I was able to make the other kids in the class laugh. I went from being the lazy idiot to the lazy idiot troublemaker, and I was better off. I got a bit of respect from some of my classmates, and a kind of dignity was restored. When I started getting these notes back from my son's school, saying that he was lazy and disruptive, I couldn't get over how angry I felt. Imagine being told your child is drowning, but he's just too lazy to swim. It's too easy to brand him lazy or disruptive. That lets him off the hook too easily. He wants to do well just like anyone else, but he needs more help from the school, and he's just not getting it. I'm shocked to realize how little schools have learned about dyslexia since I was there over 40 years ago. And they've the cheek to call us slow learners. A lot of people seem to think that dyslexia is nothing more than a problem to be overcome. Our education system looks like it could have been specially designed to stop people with dyslexia reaching their potential. people obviously would, when they hear dyslexia, think difficulties with literacy. And that is, I suppose, one of the first areas that becomes obvious because particularly, you know, when younger children get into school, it's often one of the early signs, you know, a child is having difficulty with reading, difficulty with the phonics, the sounds that make up language, difficulty with spelling, with writing. W.B. Yeats struggled in school with reading and spelling. He was always near the bottom of the class, but he went on to become one of the world's most widely read poets, a master of expressive language. But he never mastered grammar or spelling. The classic thing is the child who can maybe give a very good oral answer, but can't get their thoughts down in written form the same way at all. So obviously, um, let's say in an exam situation, that, can, that could lead to underperformance in a child not reaching their potential. Um, but dyslexia can affect other areas as well, so it can sometimes affect maths. Einstein had difficulty with simple basic maths. His school teachers thought he was mentally slow. But as we know, he managed to scrape through in the end. It affects memory, your ability to retain information. For, for remembering names, um, numbers, and uh, tables, forget it, still don't know them. I'd study for hours and I'd remember nothing. And obviously the difficulties again would vary a lot because dyslexia again covers a big spectrum. I have an audio sequential deficit, it sounds wonderful, but what it is is that sometimes um, if somebody is saying a word, I actually hear something very different. I have a big thing about, uh, I can't say the alphabet. I'm 54 now and I still can't say the alphabet. A dyslexic woman works in the same office building for 16 years. But every day, she has difficulty finding her office. The woman's name is Diana Schwank. According to the Wall Street Journal, she is one of America's top economic forecasters. Richard Branson, a dyslexic man, says he had no understanding of school whatsoever and that he failed IQ tests. He's now a billionaire. And when he was running the largest group of private companies in Europe, 
he was unable to tell the difference between gross profit and net profit. It's as if dyslexics find the easy stuff hard, but the hard stuff easy. So we'll say for most of us, we have a profile where we have small strengths and weaknesses like that. For people with dyslexia, their profile is often described as like the Himalayas because it can be like this. So they have these huge relative strengths, but also then there can, they can be corresponding areas of, of, of difficulty, you know. Today, the way the education system is set up, those kind of difficulties certainly spell trouble. Society may not have caught up yet, but there's a growing number of academics who believe that there's a very positive side to being dyslexic. Have we been so focused on the problems that people with dyslexia face that we've missed the bigger picture? The gift of dyslexia is truly the gift of mastery. A dyslexic person can master things faster than the ordinary person can even understand them. We desperately need people who can think differently. And there is good evidence that that's one of the things, the positive things that dyslexics can do. So you do need uh, dyslexics around to really change um, our view of things. And that's very often what they do. So they're very important. We're all talented in different ways. You know, some of us, I, I can't sing, you know? I can't sing, am I stupid because I can't sing? No, I don't think so, and I don't think anyone would say that. It's socially acceptable not to be able to sing, but not to be able to read and write. People don't understand that. Some people believe the dyslexic brain is part of the natural diversity that has given the human race an evolutionary advantage. Others believe dyslexia is just a fancy word for being a bit stupid. The human brain, the most complex organ in the entire known universe. Could it be that one in 10 of these wonderful brains are just a bit thick? Surely that would be a disastrous design fault and an insult to God's competence as a creator. According to the experts, if you're dyslexic, by definition, you are of at least average intelligence. But I want to talk to somebody with a scientific background who understands how the brain works and how that relates to dyslexia. I'm a neurologist by training, I run a, a um, charity called the Dyslexia Research Trust. The research we do there leads through directly to improving the way in which children can see the letters and therefore how they learn to read. Welcome. I'm on my way to Oxford. Kind of complicated directions, but I have my son Farrell here to help me with the navigation. There are many techniques now for looking at the brain in action. Um, so that there are ways of seeing whether or not the brain is different. And we and others have done many kinds of study. And what's come out loud and clear is that there are certain areas in the left hemisphere uh, which is known to be involved in language, which are activated differently in dyslexics. In effect, their brain is physically different from other people. Yes, and it, well, you mustn't think that this means that it's damaged in any way, it's just different. Do you think they're low in intelligence? Absolutely not. I mean, the, the many dyslexics are extremely intelligent, but if they can survive their schooling and somebody um, C continues to feed their self-confidence so that they don't lose all their self-confidence, then they can uh, do very well. 
My name is Professor John Stein. I'm a lecturer in neuroscience at the Oxford University Medical School and also fellow and tutor in medicine at this college, Magdalen College. I think I saw a speech she gave and towards the end of it you had a section called The Advantages of Dyslexia. Could you outline what you were talking about there in relation to that? Well, during the development of the brain, there's competition between all the kinds of nerve cells, and the ones that lose out in the competition die, or at any rate, are impaired in their development. Impaired development of one set of cells, but to the benefit of other cells. So the, the impairment of this magnocellular system is compensated for, very often, by superior performance of other nerve, parts of the nervous system. That means that other sets of cells, in particular parvo cells, are more um, developed and therefore um, can make better connections. And the result is that the things that, that the parvo cells do are actually better in dyslexics. And it turns out that they're important for uh, holistic kinds of processing, seeing a whole scene uh, and seeing how all the bits fit together uh, as a whole. And that latter uh, attribute is what dyslexics are often very good at. That's why they make good architects, artists, um, even entrepreneurs. Very often dyslexics are highly creative. You probably know that uh, Sir Richard Rogers, who is himself dyslexic, will not, or, or prefers to have people who are dyslexic in his architect's office because he finds that they are much better at seeing how a building will look when it's finished. I gave a lecture on uh, dyslexia and creativity the other day, which, um, which I summarised the research there is, and it's, there, is, there is enough to make it at least plausible, I think very likely, that dyslexics have these high talents. So dyslexics may be weak in one area, but strong in another but that's the way they're supposed to be. So stop saying they've got a learning disability. There's nothing wrong with dyslexics. It's the education system itself that's got the learning disability. I asked somebody who's quite well known in, in Ireland a while back, um, he was been invited to something, we'll say the Dyslexia Association are running, and I happened to meet him and I put the invite out and he said, oh yes, I have a friend in England who can cure that. And I just thought, oh, I rest my case. You know, there's, you continually come up with people who do not understand. And so I would think anybody who's just found out, just go very slow, find out exactly what your particular, um, no, how it affects you. Like, as I said, the health thing, sometimes I, that's not even looked at, that it affects health. Um, and then, you know, just um, work on the confidence, do whatever it takes to kind of find out what can be done because it is, it's actually quite, as, as I said before, if somebody said there's a pill, take it and you won't have to sex the morning, I'd refuse to take it. I think it's a wonderful thing to have. Next, I want to talk to a dyslexic man whose IQ is high enough to be in the top 2% worldwide. You, you were telling me your wife is uh, doing a book on dyslexia. Could you just tell me a little bit about that? Um, my wife Jenny is not dyslexic and it gets quite bitter about it at times. Well, we can't all be perfect. <laughs> um, so uh, as a, a fundraiser for the Dyslexia Association, she was quite surprised to find out, for instance, that, that, um, that Albert Einstein was dyslexic, that, that Leonardo da Vinci was dyslexic, Michelangelo was dyslexic, that, that, that Tom Cruise is, and, and so many other people that we know, and to compile their, their stories. And she was titling the book, I'll never be successful because I'm not dyslexic. Brendan O'Carroll, apart from being a comedian, a successful playwright, a best-selling author, a filmmaker, an entrepreneur, and an aspiring politician, what have you ever done with your life? <laughs> <laughs> when I was six, seven years of age, at that point, I thought I was just stupid. I couldn't keep up with the kids in, in school. Uh, I certainly wasn't able to complete the work that they were completing. By the time I got to fourth or fifth class, a composition that was terrifying. I mean, it was, it was absolutely terrifying. Um, I didn't know I was dyslexic. I just 
thought it was slower, it was different. I knew, I, I, looking at, because of the sport I had at home, I knew I was bright, I knew I wasn't a, a fool. I, 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 there are times when I did have flashes of, am I stupid? Is that why I can't learn? Like, am, I, am I stupid? But I was very lucky that I had the support at home that kind of went, no, you're not. Um, and, and that was confirmed. Then when, when I, I um, took the three men's tests and became a member of Mensa. That, that I had a high enough IQ to be in the top 2% worldwide, but I was a slow reader. A lot of dyslexics don't feel intelligent in an education system that focuses on the written word and memorizing, where their talents go unrecognized and they're actually set up to fail. They may be working a lot harder than the other children, and they're rewarded with the humiliation of low grades and told that they need to work harder. Ring, ring. I'm meeting with Tom Mulcahy, a music teacher Hello, who's man. just finished his know, master's cool. degree. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you too. Yeah, great. Can you come? I teach in, in the jazz department in UCC. I also teach privately because I found I really like it and I'm, I found that I'm very good at it. When I was growing up in school, uh, I was taught by the Christian Brothers and uh, like I was just left there for the whole of primary class. I was kept back well, maybe one year, but I was just left there. And uh, by the time I left primary school, like I'd never passed an exam, then I was going into secondary school. <laughs> it was a horrible way to be. But I'm also shocked to hear that it's kind of what's going on now. I, I think it's scandalous. You know? I was talking to a, a friend of mine the other day, and his son is in the same position now, and his son is 18. And he feels his son was just left there as well. I mean, I was shocked to think that this, that's going on. It's still going on. It's still today. going on, yeah. I'm not proud of the fact, but very open of the fact that I'm dyslexic and that I'm learn differently. How does dyslexia affect you? Well, it affects my reading, it affects my writing, it affects my maths, and it can change my handwriting from one day to the next. Like, it could be perfect one day and dreadful the next day. So, Ellen, how did you find your overall experience in school? Uh, difficult with some certain subjects and certain teachers and stuff like that. Do you think the majority of teachers have a good understanding of dyslexia? A lot of my teachers are very understanding about dyslexia. I do have some who don't have a clue what they're talking about when it comes to dyslexia. They just don't understand dyslexia, they don't understand what it's like. So they kind of look at me as if to say, how on earth can you not understand this question? And that's when I kind of find myself saying to them, look, I'm not, you know, stupid, I just don't understand the question. And sometimes if I ask them to explain it again, they'll explain it the exact same way as they did the first time. And if I say I still don't understand, then they start getting angry at me and it's something I can't help. But I do get looks of kind of bewilderment of why I don't understand them. But mo the majority of my teachers are very understanding and are always there to help me when and where I need it. It's really, really important that parents don't put too much faith in the education system. There's a man burst into my office with a camera. <laughs> They've been um, dis disabled, in a sense, by the education system. Instead of recognising that they think in a different way and, and educating them to capitalise on that. The education system seems to spend a lot of time trying to make them fit into a box that they're not comfortable in. 
Because I think most dyslexics can't, don't, won't think within that frame, and I'm never quite sure which one it is, uh, that, in, that, that gives them that kind of uh, advantage stroke disadvantage and, and does tend to make them creative. What stops them being creative is usually lack of confidence. I don't think it's the dyslexia that holds people back. I think it's, it's the, the loss of, of, of self-confidence and self-respect and, and that's down to schooling and it's an absolute disaster. Uh, she has a bit of extra it, teacher. She's like trying to make it easier for us. She's really nice and all. She's really nice about it and she, she, she does help you. Like, I don't like reading in front of the class because then I can get stuck on a really easy word because I'm so nervous. I mean, when I was reading the thing, I was shaking. My hands are shaking and I mean, the page is shaking. Oh, because it makes me feel like other people don't even have to try and we have to try so hard. Well, maybe you just need to try harder. But I try my hardest. I always do. What about you, so maybe you need to try harder? I'm trying my best. I can't do anything more than my best. It's, it's like... It's like it's I'm like not even people, trying, even though It's I like am. people in my class, the person, it's like them trying their worst. But me trying my best, it's like them trying their worst. Are you a bit lazy, Jimmy? No, no I'm trying so try hard. hard. I'm trying as hard as I can. Like people kind of cut a bit of, uh, lots of your brain out, and then you only have a bit. Like uh, you're only able to use 2% to your brain. You only have to use 2% of your brain, that's what it's like. Yes, I thought I should just give up because there's just everyone else knows and I just don't know. I just don't feel like trying anymore. A lot of people think of their dyslexia as a type of intelligence that has helped them to succeed in life. I found this really good website called Dyslexic Advantage. It's got all kinds of information about dyslexia. And it's got lots of videos of people who struggled in school, but went on to achieve great things in later life. I'm going to try and get an interview with the people who run this website. I'm Brock Eide. And I'm Fernette Eide. And together we run the Eide Neuro Learning Clinic in Edmonds, Washington, just north of Seattle. Dyslexia is often characterized as a problem to be overcome, but that's really not how we see it. There's a recognition that dyslexics really do have a different way of processing information. The immediate response we would like to see from people when they find out that their child is dyslexic or that they're dyslexic is, oh good, let's take advantage of all those wonderful strengths and let's, let's look at how these can be used. Some of the biggest problems that we see with children with dyslexia and dealing with the educational system arise from the fact that their developmental pathway is very different from the pathway that the educational program is designed uh, optimally to suit. So you're asking students to focus their greatest attention on things that they're really not optimally suited for in the early grades. Kids lose their confidence. They lose the ability to hope that those things are going to happen. The message is that these kids have internalized from years of being stuck in an environment that's really not aimed at, at uh, helping them develop in the way that they're pre-programmed to develop. But, instead to focus attention on the things that they, that they struggle with. Dyslexia is really a reflection of a nervous system that's been organized to work in an entirely different way and to process information in a different way. And that difference creates a whole range of advantages. In our book, we talk a lot about the kind of advantages that we see in individuals with dyslexia. We call them the mind strengths. M stands for material reasoning, and it's basically a form of spatial reasoning, but it focuses primarily on three-dimensional as opposed to two-dimensional spatial reasoning. Material reasoning can be things from fashion design. It could be things like engineering. Uh, the I is for interconnected reasoning, and that includes things like the ability to see analogies, seeing relationships between words and concepts and ideas that are more distant, more unusual and to see just, to see the most important overriding central concept that links together a variety of things. So that's the 
these um, these cross transdisciplinary sorts of people who connect things like mathematics and science and you know and anthropology or something like that. They're they're people who fall outside of, of traditional categories. And it's for narrative reasoning. And by narrative, we mean primarily the ability to form concepts that are based on cases, examples, experiences. The narrative strains can be something like a musician, or it could be something like a, a storyteller, or a fiction writer, or a journalist. And D is dynamic reasoning, which basically means the ability to use that kind of personal memory to make simulations in your mind about outcomes for things that you could, you could think about happening. It's the ability to function in environments where the variables are changing, where they're unknown, where you only have part of the picture. That's the kind of setting where we see dyslexics really ex excelling and doing much better than other people. The dynamic reasoning could be things from a science fiction writer, or it could be uh, the economic forecasters, what's going to happen next, or a lot of these entrepreneurial types. They see where real estate is now, where is it going to be in the future. These are tremendous strengths for anything, you know, uh, you know, almost any career, but I don't think we've really had our focus on it. And, and so discovering that that tends to be a particular talent of, of uh, people with dyslexia is just like a, you know, it's a gold mine. Put them in an environment where they're solving problems, where they're having to face new situations and challenges, and that's the area where they just blow everybody else away. When you look at the great creative contributions uh, throughout uh, history, whether it's in art or architecture or medicine or science, you find that dyslexics make an outsized contribution to the creative achievement in the world. By failing to nurture the young dyslexics and to bring them along and to help them develop in the way that they're meant to develop, rather than trying to turn them into something else, we're missing out on a huge opportunity for developing some of the most creative minds in our society. One of the most important things is to identify dyslexia as early as possible in order that children won't lose all their self-confidence. Because as soon as you tell them that they're dyslexic, a sort of weight lifts off them. And that is an incredible relief very often. Just the diagnosis helps them enormously. You have to tap this, 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 this register. That's it. About 12 years ago, uh, through conversation, someone said it to me and I just went for a test. And uh, I discovered I was dyslexic. I was very emotional when I found that out. It was really hit me like... Because it, it, it made sense of all those years in school, you know. I was emotional and very angry as well. And what was the anger about? Uh, like the years of frustration and like, because uh, it really shaped my life, you know. When my son got a diagnosis of dyslexia a few years ago, it made me wonder whether I might be dyslexic myself. So I decided to get a proper assessment done. Yeah, even if you, if you have the screen there, it might give you a bit of, a bit more grip. Fast there, it's got out of battery. What? Can't turn it up. I'm in Malahide. I'm here to meet Anna Dangerfield, who's an educational psychologist. I myself am dyslexic which uh, to me is a major advantage actually in the current situation. You meet a lot of adults who are still suffering and will tell you. I mean, I, I have sat around the table with parents where a child is being diagnosed and I've described what it's like for the child to experience a difficulty in school. And suddenly one of the parents will say to me, well, actually, that's what school was like for me. I've had parents who have broken down and cried because they are so relieved that their child is not going to go through what they went through. And that to me says so much about our system and, and, and the untold pain that people can go through. The first thing we do when, when either a child or an adult comes in, we do an IQ test. And the reason we do the IQ test is to establish the level of ability of the client. And when we establish that level, then we can say, if the IQ is at a certain level, the child should be reading, writing and spelling at a level 
in line with their IQ ability. So now we can say, here is the gap between your IQ score and your spelling score. And that shows us what we call a significant discrepancy, a gap, which is big enough for us to say, well, yeah, that would help to define a dyslexic profile. This is testing long-term visual memory. Can you see what's wrong with that picture? What's missing in that picture? And it's testing to see if, you know, if you've been taking in the things that are around you in the world and, and very much would be visual memory. Um, this one, which a lot of people may at one stage or another have done, is what we call matrix reasoning. And it's pattern recognition. Now, when you're reading or when you're spelling, they're patterns. So this one is a very useful test to see if you have poor pattern recognition. I'm actually quite nervous about having this assessment. I'm afraid I'm going to do badly and come out of it looking stupid. And it'll be just like another failed school test. This is, this is different because what we're looking at really are your strengths, your, the ways you learn, your strengths, your weaknesses, um, and above all, a, a sort of more complete profile. I mean, that's certainly how I see it. There I am doing the assessment. I'm actually quite enjoying it. Some of it I'm finding easy, other parts I'm definitely struggling with. And now I'm going to be given the preliminary results of my assessment. But your full scale IQ then is coming in up here in the upper, uh, in the high average range. Wow. Yeah, in the 81st percentile. Okay. Which is very creditable. Whatever your fears this morning were, they're certainly unjustified. You're an extremely bright man, which I knew anyway. Now, when we break down into areas of strength and weaknesses, then you can see what's pulling you back. Right. And some of it would be very much in line with a classic dyslexic profile. Processing okay. speed and uh, working memory would both yeah, fit in. commonly fit in within. Yeah. And the other thing that I would say affected you probably in school was the speed at which you read. Mm. Because if you put processing speed is about doing things under timed conditions, but it's also about thinking about what you have to do. Yeah. So if you're doing that in an exam situation, you have to take time to think, it's going to slow you up. Right. And that in turn is going to reduce the amount of time you have to do the tasks. And of course, our education system is hugely dependent on working memory. Yeah. Your verbal comprehension index is coming in up here in the, up at 129, which is the very top of the uh, superior range of ability. Okay. So very close to the very superior range of right. ability at the 97th percentile, which means that only three people out of every hundred are better than you are in that area. Wow. So it's a very creditable score. So that was really quite an emotional experience. It's as if the confusion and the types of difficulties I've experienced throughout my life have been acknowledged here today for the very first time. I think this will give me more understanding and a better insight into myself. Now, I had a very good experience when I had my assessment, but not everybody has such a good experience when they go to see their psychologists. There's no room any, anymore for a little bit of old-fashioned eccentricity. It seems to be gone out the window entirely unless you conform precisely to their tests. All of these reports I was getting were contrary to my instincts. It's just, it's a shame that I couldn't enjoy their eccentricity. One of them liked to play with his fingers, and I used to giggle, look, he's, he's making operas, because he'd be <laughs> and dancing around and marching around, and I thought this was great fun, and instead I had these people looking at him, very weird, very weird. And now he's you know, extremely creative, is writing songs and making up music and harmonizing and busking, making his own money. He's only 16. Yeah, he's ex extremely creative. 
in this junior cert, the lowest mark he got was a B in a high level paper. He's A's and B's. He got an A in music and an A in maths, honours. The child I was told should go to a school for Down syndrome type of children. That it would be cruel otherwise to pitch him in with these other children who would ruin his life. Thank you. It's very common to have dyslexia, Asperger syndrome, ADHD, uh, behavioral problems, dyspraxia, which is simply uh, clumsiness and awkwardness, and sensory integration problems. By that I mean people who are upset by loud noises and, and that kind of thing. So you tend to get these, uh, these problems, in, uh, they tend to go together in a, in a spectrum, not just the dyslexia on, on its own, and indeed, a lot of the people that I see, they have a single diagnosis of dyslexia and all these other conditions, they have them as well. And they're, they're very often missed. Do you think being dyslexic could give somebody an advantage in life? Yes, it does. But it gives them a disadvantage at primary school and secondary school and maybe even university. But when, you get it, when they find their niche later on in life, it, it, it gives them a, mat a massive advantage because the genes that, 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 that give you this uh, dyslexia are the same genes that give you creativity in later life. Of course, the, the problem is that the, the spirit may be knocked out of these children by the time they get to out of, out of the educational system and they, may, they, they just may be so disillusioned and, and, and worn out that they just give up. What's messing got to do with dyslexia? Messing in class got to do with dyslexia? I can't. I couldn't. I couldn't keep attention on things, you know. Um, as well as that, it's avoidance. You know, if you ask me a question I don't want to answer, what am I going to do? I'm going to do something to, to distract you. I'm going to do something to try and get away from it. I'm going to bring up another question. I'm going to do something. It's avoidance. It's, that's what it's about. Messing in class was avoidance to the fact that I couldn't do things. <laughs> What were the teachers like? I know there was one teacher you had a, a bit of a problem with. Remember he kind of looked at me all the time like, what's wrong with this kid? He's, he's an idiot. He's stupid. Yeah, maybe I was stupid. Probably am, but... You're not stupid. Yeah, maybe so, but at the same time, well, it's not like that in school. child with dyslexia you worry you worry are you doing the right things are you doing enough God, like he's so lazy in class he just don't, he's not understanding anything he's not late oh. no working or trying lazy in class lazy in the exam made no effort this needs to change I'm standing outside Dublin City University. I'm about to go into a lecture by Ronald Davis, author of the international best-selling book, The Gift of Dyslexia. He's about to give a talk on the Davis Method. When we, when we see a child coming from school where they're given the label of unintelligent or lazy or they're just not applying themselves, what this is telling us is the person that's observing the child struggling does not understand what is at the root of the struggle. The individual is trying as hard as he can try. He is at his wit's end on his effort and his energy. And people who may be le much less intelligent than, than he is are criticizing him and telling him that he's stupid. Now, they may feel that they're dumb or stupid, and the reason for that is they see other people doing things that are very easy for other people to do. And no matter how hard they do it, they can't. So 
a, a dyslexic child does not need for somebody else to tell them that they're not intelligent. I mean, they're seeing evidence of that all around them. And the evidence is false. The evidence that they're seeing is a product of not including their method of thinking into the education system so they can then really show what they can do. There are a number of things that a dyslexic person is doing that will cause their dyslexia to be there that actually will, will make them more intelligent and more creative than the average human being. This kind of thinking is, in my opinion, the source of all of the major inventions or innovations that have come about that makes it possible for, for people to live the way they live on the planet Earth today. I was once being interviewed on a television program in San Francisco, California, and the, the host of that show asked, well, she started off saying the names of a large number of very famous and successful dyslexic people. And then she said, isn't it strange that all of these people could be successful in spite of their dyslexia? I'm sitting there thinking, it's not in spite of their dyslexia, it's because of it. Every day the child goes into school with dyslexia, undiagnosed, that child says to themselves maybe a hundred times a day, I am stupid, I am hopeless, I'm no good, uh, as a person I'm worthless. Uh, that co continues on, then they get very depressed, uh, they may drop out of school, they may become suicidal. So it has a, de a devastating effect on their self-esteem and, uh, and it can have a devastating effect on their life course. There are a lot of fantastic teachers out there doing a brilliant job under very difficult circumstances. And it's because of those teachers and the help they get from parents that a lot of dyslexics do very well. But for every dyslexic that succeeds, I wonder how many end up in jail instead of university. We're entitled to a proper education system that includes everybody. If our children are our greatest resource, then we're wasting some of our most precious resources. If our children are our future, then it's time we invested in our future and invested in an education system with a radically new approach that acknowledges the different ways that people learn and express themselves. Not the one-size-fits-all, sink-or-swim system we have at the moment. You might not be doing well in school. You may have a bad memory or difficulty with reading, writing, or spelling, or some other problem. You might be in the bottom of the class, but, 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 but you're in good company. Here are the names of, here are the names of, here are the names of some of the many famous and talented individuals who are dyslexic or have traits associated with dyslexia or related learning difficulties. Winston Churchill, JFK, Leonardo da Vinci, Pablo Picasso, Albert Einstein, Charles Darwin, Muhammad Ali, Magic Johnson. The list includes people who are entrepreneurs, writers, journalists, filmmakers, designers, military heroes, surgeons, scientists, entertainers, inventors, actors, artists, architects, athletes, musicians, physicians, and even politicians. George Washington, Andy Warhol, Steven Spielberg, Dustin Hoffman, Oliver Reed, Ben Elton, John Lennon, one in ten people are dyslexic. Imagine all the people. Louis Pasteur, Beethoven, Brando, Billy Bob Thornton, Thomas Edison, Tom Cruise, Harrison Ford, Jack Nicholson, Danny Glover, Walt Disney, Whoopi Goldberg, Mozart, the Wright Brothers, and Robin Williams, Steve.